All right, I think we're ready to get started. Thanks everyone for joining again. My name is Amichai Fight. I'm representing the CJL Student Board, and it's really a pleasure to welcome you all to this discussion tonight. Uh, before we begin, I just want to thank Professor Zelzer for joining us and also Princeton Vote 100 for participating. Uh, and I also want to highlight that this event uh, was planned uh, and inspired by um, Meet to Vote, which is Hill International's initiative to get students to vote in the upcoming election. So everyone should keep that in mind. Um, we're also really happy to have, as many of you saw, Adam Hoffman, the president of College Republicans, and Celia Bookband, the president of College Democrats, uh, who are both active and uh, members and leaders of the CGL community uh, moderating tonight's talk. Um, so I'll hand things over to them in a moment. Uh, but just to give everyone a sense of what's going to happen over the next hour, uh, Professor Zelzer will speak for roughly 20 minutes. Uh, then Celia and Adam will answer, uh, will ask him some questions. Uh, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Uh, we can take questions in the chat, or if people feel inclined, you can raise your hands uh, and um, speak up over Zoom. Um, and as our, is our custom, we're going to take questions first from students and then open up to members of the broader community. Um, so now I'll hand things over to Adam. Thanks, Amichai. So I speak for Celia and myself when I say that we are glad to be here and excited to be part of this conversation, Decision 5781, American Jews in Politics. We're pleased to welcome Professor Zelizer. Professor Zelizer has been among the pioneers in the revival of American political history, is the Malcolm Steven Stevenson Forbes class of 1941, professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, and a CNN contributor um, and a regular guest on NPR's Here and Now. He's the author and editor of 20 books, including The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battle for Great Society, the winner of the D.V. Hardman Prize for the best book on Congress, um, and Fault Lines, a history of the United States since 1974, co-authored with Kevin Cruz. His new book is Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and the Rise of the New Republican Party. He's currently writing a new book on Abraham Joshua Heschel for the Jewish Live series of Yale University. Professor Zelizer has published over 1,000 op-eds, has received fellowships from the Brookings Institute, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the New York Historical Society, and New America. Is also the co-host of a popular podcast called Politics and Polls. We are excited to learn from Professor Zelizer this evening. Professor Zelizer. Thank you. Thanks so much for that nice introduction. It's uh, nice to be here with all of you to see uh, such a great turnout. Thank you for organizing this. It's nice to see uh, Abigail, my daughter, staring at me on a Zoom screen. So I get to see her as an added bonus and I can see my parents have joined as well. So uh, family, family connections in a conversation I've thought about many times um, and enjoyed talking about over the years as, as the story um, evolves. And I hope before I start that everyone's doing all right, everyone is healthy, and I hope everyone has a plan to vote, um, which, which you should have, whether you're Republican, Democratic, or uh, Independent. So make sure you know how this will happen if you haven't already voted. So I thought I'd uh, just throw a few thoughts out about American Jews and uh, politics. Uh, this is a issue that comes up literally every presidential election, although actually a little less this time than others. Uh, there has been certainly in the last decade or so, this ongoing conversation, will American Jews shift to the Republican Party? Um, American Jewish voters have primarily voted for the Democratic Party since the 1930s. Uh, during the Great Depression when Franklin Roosevelt put together what was called the New Deal Coalition and started to attract the Jewish vote in very large numbers. He won over 80% of the Jewish vote in 1932, and those numbers would continue to rise uh, through his final campaign in 1944. 
Uh, and since the conservative movement came into American politics in the 1970s, which was a coalition of neoconservatives uh, who had been Democrats and shifted to the Republican Party because of the foreign policy, conservative uh, evangelical Christians who started to mobilize politically, business and Wall Street conservatives, there's been this question, would they gradually be able to change the basic dynamic of American politics? Would they be able to shift the vote? Uh, in the 1980 election, when Ronald Reagan ran against President Jimmy Carter, uh, he had some progress. He was able to secure about 39% of the Jewish vote, which is not a majority, uh, but uh, relative, it was a pretty big accomplishment, although the numbers would go back to the Democrats very, uh, very quickly. The Jewish vote is unusually important, even though it's a very small portion of the American population. Uh, what politicians know is that Jewish voters tend to vote. They tend to be very organized and disciplined, and they tend to throw a lot of support to the candidate uh, who they like. And so there's always been a lot of attention on constituencies like American Jews who you can count on to be active uh, in, in the election. Uh, in 2004, just as an example of what I'm talking about, someone named Matthew Brooks, who was the head of the Republican Jewish Coalition, predicted, he said, it's now undeniable that there is a major shift taking place among Jewish voters. And even though George W. Bush only won 19% of the Jewish vote in 2000, he predicted because of the aftermath of 9-11, because of national security concerns, that Bush would secure a huge percentage of the vote uh, in the 2004 campaign against John Kerry. In the end, he only got 24%, a little better than his first run, but that alignment uh, didn't, didn't happen. We've had uh, until, the until March when we all separated uh, as a university, there was discussion again of whether President Trump would be able to do well uh, with the Jewish vote in part because of his strong support for the Israeli government. Uh, some of that conversation has faded, uh, I think because of the pandemic. Uh, I'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. So, so the question is why do uh, American Jews tend to vote uh, for the Democratic Party and why do they continue to do so even as American politics has shifted to the right and many other constituencies like Irish Catholics have often broken with democratic traditions to shift uh, much more heavily to the GOP. And there's different arguments that people make. I'm not gonna answer the question. I'll just throw out a few. Uh, one has to do with Jewish theology and tradition. And there is an argument that is made uh, that there is a logic uh, to the uh, kind of worldview of Judaism that leans liberal, that uh, from the uh, requirement of the mitzvot uh, to stories of Exodus, there is a natural uh, affinity uh, for many Jews who go to synagogue, who hear these stories at their Passover Seder to ultimately vote for a party whose values are closer to, to that tradition. Uh, the problem with that is obviously many Jews have taken those same lessons and those same practices and ended up uh, as political conservatives. So it's not automatic that happens, but there is an argument uh, that that is relevant. A second argument is that Judaism is a religion which has suffered through uh, oppression, brutality, uh, vicious attacks throughout its history. And so as the Democratic Party after the 1930s became a party that uh, embraced pluralism, embraced civil rights, embraced the idea that ultimately the role of government was to help the disadvantaged and to make sure those kinds of social biases were not tolerated, the history of the Jewish people resonated with the kind of arguments that Democrats were making. And you could really see that in the 1960s during the civil rights movement, when many civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King and others would talk about the Jewish experience uh, often through Exodus as a way to explain what the movement for racial equality was trying, trying to, to achieve. A third argument that people make is, is less ideological. 
it's just about where American Jews have lived uh, since the immigration of Eastern European Jews in the early uh, part of the 20th century, many Jews concentrated in areas of the country that were heavily democratic and have remained democratic. So uh, cities such as New York or Boston or Philadelphia, where the democratic machine has remained throughout pretty formidable, uh, voters and their families over generations remained pretty loyal uh, to, to what the party had offered those immigrants, not just Jewish immigrants, but immigrants more broadly, from jobs to political enfranchisement to a sense of connection with the civic community. And many American Jews through this day remain in what we now call blue areas of, of the country. So it makes sense that uh, they're gonna continue to vote like many people around them, especially in an era when people vote that way. Uh, there, there's less difference within communities of the way that final vote breaks. And, and finally, an, another argument that is quite important is the nature of the Republican Party since certainly the 1990s and early 2000s. Two things that have been very notable, which I think continue to make it difficult for the Republicans to attract a large majority of American Jewish voters. One, the Republican Party has moved toward a very an increasingly narrow path, which is really playing out in the last few elections where the base of the party is moving away from what Ronald Reagan envisioned in 1980, or even George W. Bush still thought possible in 2000, uh, and focused really on a pretty narrow coalition of rural, uh, less educated white voters in particular pockets of the country. And the party is depending on the institutions of government, the electoral college, gerrymandering, and much more, uh, and the, the structure of the Senate to make sure that that coalition keeps going on. And I think there is a, often a clash between what uh, the Republican constituency wants and where a lot of Democrats fall in, in the polls. And, and the other part of this is, is what I said a few minutes ago, that the Republican Party born out of the Reagan years uh, was a party where the, uh, in the religious right, as it was called, the moral majority, which was based in evangelical Christianity, had a very strong place in the GOP. It defined what a lot of the issues were. We're seeing that if anyone's watching the confirmation today uh, and, and some of the questions that are coming certainly from the Republicans about expectations from the nominee. Uh, and, and I think while that offered some possibilities for the GOP on issues like Israel, for example, where evangelicals are very strong supporters uh, of, of the state, on other issues it creates a disconnect. The separation between church and state, certain civil liberties questions, even reproductive rights. And I don't think Republican leaders have really managed to bring those two together. And it creates a barrier toward this hope that there's ever gonna be a, a huge expansion. And I would add finally that uh, Israel has not yet proved to be the kind of wedge issue that some Republican operatives keep thinking it will be. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, you know, the, the, the perfect explanation of that. One of the issues is that there has been a lot of bipartisan support on Israel even though uh, you certainly hear from some more critical figures now in the Democratic Party, uh, that overall there's been a consensus. If you look at the Democratic leadership, it's, it's been very strongly supportive of the Israeli government. And because it's still pretty bipartisan, that the break the GOP hoped for uh, has not been as strong as some thought. And also it's just not the issue that all American Jewish voters vote on. Um, Despite comments we've heard, including from the President of the United States, many, uh, most American Jews vote on other issues, the same kinds of issues that we're hearing in the debate. So I think it's mitigated some of that strategic effort to win American Jewish voters uh, in that particular way. I was just looking through the numbers. It, it hasn't really changed uh, in, in the last few election cycles, Al Gore, uh, won 79% of the Jewish vote in the 2000 election against George W. Bush. 
Barack Obama uh, won, uh, he won, I think, uh, I think he won 78% of the Jewish vote in 2000, uh, in 2008. And that number went down in 2012 against Mitt Romney, but it was still 69%. So even the moments when Republicans are pleased with the results, it's still much less than a majority of the vote. Uh, the vote went the same way in 2016, and in the midterm elections, American Jews voted overwhelmingly for the Democratic, Democratic Party. According to all the polls that we're seeing right now, there's no reason to expect any big change. Uh, Jews are registering through the polls that over 70% are very likely to vote for the Biden Harris, uh, Harris ticket. So, so I don't think that's going to change. The one area where you do see a notable change in this trend is in the Orthodox community. Uh, and in, in many pockets of the Orthodox community, there has been a tendency to vote uh, for the Republicans. And so one of the question is, as that population grows within the United States, does it actually start to broaden the ability of Republicans to attract that vote? A uh, few final thoughts, uh, I would say, the issue of anti-Semitism, which was really front and center uh, before the pandemic hit, I think has faded uh, as the same kind of issue that it was when there was a march here in New York and it was in the news, like all issues right now, it's been overwhelmed by the effects of the pandemic. It's still there. My guess is it will break both ways. I think for a lot of Democrats, they will see anti-Semitism looming large within the administration, and that will only be part of the mix of why they continue to vote for the Democrats. And I think for Republicans who are already uh, going to vote for the Republicans, they'll pick up on statements from some of the legislators in the class of 2018 and, and use that as further justification. But it's not going to be an issue that swings a huge part of the, the Jewish vote either way. I think the way to think of the Jewish vote in, in 2020, and I'll conclude soon so we can start our conversation, is like everything else, this is an election where slivers of the electorate matter. It's not an election where it's likely that you're going to see a major landslide, although some polls suggest it's finally possible for the first time in 19, since 1984. But what the campaigns are looking at is how do you mobilize small portions of the electorate? How do you turn out the vote in slivers of the electorate? And so I think the way that ultimately the American Jewish vote will be quite important in this election is for Democrats, certainly, in states like Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, Ohio, where you've seen growing populations, are Democrats able to turn out the vote in these very close battleground states to the point that American Jews play some of the role that we saw with other voters in 2016 in states like Michigan and, and, uh, and Wisconsin? It's a turnout issue. And it, the same will be true for Republicans, where I think the uh, part of the Jewish population they really have in mind right now is not a prediction of a huge shift, but can you turn out uh, the vote in the Orthodox Jewish community enough that it becomes part of this small increase that leads to a margin of victory in some of these states? Um, it's unclear whether the population is large enough in some of the swing states to do that, but I think that's really how it's going to be uh, relevant in this election. Uh, but I think after this election is over, we'll, we'll see where things go. Um, there's a lot of interesting issues we can discuss about how the new generation of Democrats and Republicans uh, in the Jewish community might change the kinds of issues that are discussed. What are the central concerns that they worry about as voters and whether the new leadership that's emerging in both parties is going to be able to change a dynamic that's really been in place since the uh, early 1930s. So let me end it at that and we can have a conversation and then open it up to everyone else. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Professor Zelzer. Um, Adam and I are going to start off the Q&A. 
Um, and so I will start with the first question. Um, we've seen a few major Jewish figures in this cycle, either political uh, figures themselves or political figure adjacent. I'm thinking of Doug Emhoff, Jared Kushner, Bernie Sanders, et cetera. Um, have you ever, are Jewish voters actually attracted to Jewish politicians? Does it make any sort of difference? Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. And, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure the, uh, the Judaism of a candidate overwhelms the basic partisan uh, dynamics that I'm, I'm talking about. And, and I would add that's even more the case in the last few decades when political polarization has taken such a hold on the electorate that people don't move. They don't even change their vote because of a pandemic. Uh, literally a pandemic that closed us all down, the numbers remain pretty steady. And, and so I think the, the Jewish uh, identity of a candidate won't necessarily shift them as well. I mean, the, the Sanders campaign was remarkable. I mean, whatever one thinks of Bernie Sanders, and I'm sure on this Zoom call, there are many opinions, this was a major political candidate in the Democratic Party, attracting a very diverse a uh, constituency within the party uh, who, uh, who's an American Jew. And, and I think that signals something. It's not necessarily a breakthrough, uh, but it was remarkable how little it was actually discussed for much of the campaign. And it, on the Republican uh, side, you'll often hear discussion of Gerald Kushner, Jared Kushner and the Trump family, but I, I don't think that overwhelms the partisan identity people hold very strongly. Thank you, Professor. Um, so you touched on this somewhat, but to what extent can we really um, consider the Jews as a distinctive voting bloc? It seems to me um, that secular upper class cosmopolitan Jews vote like secular upper class co cosmopolitan people. You know, Jews who order their lives on traditional religious values vote like Americans who order their lives according to religious, tradi tradi religious traditional values. Um, so to what extent is it helpful or unhelpful to think of Jewish voters as a monolith um, or to recognize any sort of uniqueness um, to our voting patterns? Very good question as well. Um, and, and I think it's a fair question. Uh, I think on the first part of what you said, I do think that's part of what can be uh, at work, that American Jews as Americans have have embraced and entered into communities that tend to lean democratic. Certainly um, they do now, certainly they did back in the 1930s. And so the explanation isn't just about their religion. It's like many other ethnic groups. It's, it's where they land, the kind of jobs they have, the kinds of education that they have. In terms of religious Jews, uh, I mean, there are many, many religious Jews who do vote democratic. So that doesn't line up uh, perfectly. Uh, Orthodox certainly shouldn't be the only way we define that or we're going to get a skewed understanding uh, of the electorate. And it, it's still notable just how many Jewish voters register Democrat. And uh, even with uh, different explanations, I do think it's a number we can pay attention to. Political campaigns do all the time. I mean, and, and that doesn't mean it's right, but they're registering that there's something in this block uh, that that keeps it united uh, along the blue lines. And, and I'd say one other thing that's interesting, the other element why I think it's important, Adam, is I mentioned earlier that it's not simply how do American Jews vote, but American Jews have tended to be one community that's incredibly organized politically and incredibly active politically with high rates of voting, even though it's a minuscule part of the population. So that's probably the other reason it, it gets attention. But it's fair. I mean, it's fair. It's not always the right thing uh, or the, the best way to think about it by breaking different voters up along these lines. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question from the two of us. So I'm going to hand it back to Adam. Sure. Thanks, Celia. So um, Professor recently left wing um, writer Peter Beinart argued that there are, quote, many, 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 many Jared Kushners coming um, with a growing, increasingly orthodox, um, or with an growing and increasingly outspoken orthodox community. 
um, which generally holds more conservative views on Israel. Um, Beinart predicted that the future of Jewish pro-Israel advocacy in the United States will lean further right. Do you agree with his characterization? It might be. I mean, that that's I gave a talk about this issue. It must have been, I can't remember if it was 2008 or even earlier. And this issue came up again. I think it was even earlier. And it's a little like the demographic shift that Democrats often talk about where they're sure that the Republicans are done, uh, that it's, un, it's not sustainable, this small coalition and the Democrats are broadening. The predictions of the Orthodox Jewish vote, which Beinhardt, which Peter is talking about, have been made for some time. And it's not an inaccurate issue. And I think there's a lot of validity to it. I'm not sure that their numbers uh, outweigh the rest of the Jewish community, including secular Jews. And two, I think there is an issue that uh, the Republican Party, as it is right now, has uh, in its alliance some groups that will not sit well with an Orthodox Jew. Uh, including white extremist organizations and pretty radical mainstream elected officials uh, who have dalliances with these groups. And so I think the question that you hear within Republican politics, what is the cost of the party embracing these kinds of elements, not simply on the fringes, but even closer to the mainstream, does it undercut that trend that you're talking about? Um, because anti-Semitism is, is, a, is a powerful memory, uh, a, a powerful force in, in, in the real world, in the lives of all American Jews, reform, conservative, orthodox, and otherwise. And uh, I think even with all the discussion of President Trump and policies toward Israel, this other part of the GOP that's front and center right now is going to be an issue. And I could imagine we'll see where the Democrats go, but I could imagine them losing any advantage they might have or keeping it kind of limited because of these other elements of the party. Awesome, thank you. Um, we're now going to open it up to the audience Q&A. Um, so there's two ways that audience members can participate. You can either send your question in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but we'd like to start with um, at least a few questions from students in the audience. Um, so if any students want to send a chat or raise their hand, um, you should feel free. And I will call on you. Don't worry, I won't bite. Okay, we can we can give the students some time to think about those maybe. So um, we'll open it up. Um, yeah, I see a hand from Nicholas. Yeah, hi there. Sorry, I don't have my cooking dinner right now, so I don't have my camera on, but thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm curious about your perceptions of, or how you see the perception of Jewish voters by kind of non-Jewish party operatives in both parties, if that's changing. Um, with President Trump, we've seen kind of tropes of maybe uh, this dual loyalty trope of saying, you know, I think at an APAC conference saying, you know, I talked to your prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, even though he's talking to American Jews. Uh, and I would think maybe on the Democratic side, also maybe some progressive wing, or maybe viewing some Jewish voters and their kind of support for the Israeli government with suspicion. I'm just curious if you see any changes in those trends from, from both parties. Yeah, so, um, so, so you're talking uh, kind of about uh, public uh, discussions, certainly in the last few years about American Jews uh, being defined as voters through positions about Israel uh, and ultimately that that is the key issue uh, that, that will matter. And I, you know, I, I think certainly when I heard the president use those words, I, I thought that that's kind of an unacceptable form of rhetoric. I don't know if that was strategic or I don't know if that just is how he actually thinks of the, is, of the issue, but, but there's a danger to that. 
ultimately, when you make those kinds of comments, and, and I do know um, the comments have come, come from elsewhere, you are painting an unfair portrait of, of the American Jewish voter. And as I've discussed, it's a portrait that actually flies in the face of what we see from voting behavior. It's just not the issue that actually defines what everyone does when they go to the ballot box. And uh, I think it's a, a form of rhetoric that ranges from being sloppy to being anti-Semitic. And it's kind of been, uh, not kind of, I'll take the kind of out. It's been stunning to see this normalized and uh, made into a, a mainstream part of American discussions. It, it's possible to talk about Jewish support or opposition uh, toward Israel or US policy toward Israel without going into that kind of rhetoric. Uh, but I do think it's become more pervasive. It's not the only time we've seen this kind of uh, rhetoric emerge. We've seen it in, in other periods, including in the period that I've discussed, but it's certainly moved front and center right now. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few questions in the chat um, on the topic of Jewish donors, but I'll read this one from Josh Spurgle, who's a student. Um, you speak of trying to turn out the Jewish voter, but what if the Jewish donor? I don't know about everyone else here, but my parents get an incredible amount of mail from Jewish related political organizations. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Josh. Uh, nice, nice to hear from you. Um, I'd say, look, American politics is organized around organizations. And we have the two super organizations of American politics, the parties, which are the heaviest muscle. But then underneath that umbrella, we are in an age of organization. And Jewish voters are certainly not unique in groups that try to encourage them to vote a certain way or connect their interests to uh, potential contributions and uh, support for different candidates. So I'm sure your parents receive a lot of that, but that's a product of changes that took place in the 1970s uh, when we saw a revolution in uh, the solicitation of money and votes from different kinds of organizations. It's actually the letters you see, which now I assume are primarily email and text, it, it actually originates with the religious right in the 1970s when a guy named Richard Vigory, here's a quick history lesson, popularized something called direct mail where you would start receiving snail mail letters that looked as if they were written to you that asked for your support and that played to your concern about certain issues. In bold, it would say, do you care about you know, your church losing all its rights or your school losing all its rights? Give five bucks to our organization. And so I think what you're talking about isn't anything distinct uh, to the American Jewish community. And, and if you have a concern or an issue about that kind of politics, the, the politics that revolves around uh, the, the basis of solicitations and donations, I think that's just a bigger question of American politics that goes well beyond the subject uh, that we're studying. Uh, but look, in this moment, every group does it because it's important. Uh, this is how you raise money. And in 2020, we're in a period now where more groups are moving away from large donors, actually. Even though you'll hear in the Jewish community, for example, about someone like Sheldon Adelson, the real secret in American politics is organizations and parties are looking for broad-based support, a few dollars from a lot of people. And I think that's what you're seeing uh, from a lot of these organizations. Thank you. We're going to take our next question from Jared. Um, hello, Professor. Thank you so much. This has been very interesting. Um, my question concerns uh, current developments in New York City and how that's going to affect uh, the political calculus of American Jews. So what we're seeing this year uh, at least from my understanding, are two factors, one of them being the departure of prominent pro-Israel figures, uh, whether uh, the retirement or whether you know being challenged in a primary, people like Nita Lowy and Elliot Engel in favor of more progressive challengers. Uh, and then also on the flip side, this tenuous relationship between various Democratic elected officials uh, in the New York area and the Orthodox Jewish community 
uh, in places like Borough Park and Brooklyn. So in your opinion, how do these types of events, how are they going to affect the political calculus, uh, not only with Jews as a, as a whole, uh, but also among demographics of American Jews or denominations rather? Thanks, Jared. I mean, I think the, the fault lines you're talking about within the Democratic Party are, are not only happening in New York, they're happening elsewhere. So, so the question's a good one, and it's one that right now Democrats aren't focused on these kinds of issues, and they don't need to be, because the overwhelming emphasis on defeating President Trump looms so large for Democrats that I think a lot of the divisions and tensions that played out in the primary or play out on these issues within New York they fade away until this election is over. I think that's a natural phenomenon when you have a candidate or a president who's this divisive uh, and, and has such low support within the electorate. But I think both are relevant. Look, there is this question of, and, and the terminology matters. Look, I, and I'm not gonna give you a terminology to use, but whether you're talking about younger Democrats who are opposed to Israel, or younger Democrats who are just more critical of the Israeli government, as they are often critical of the American government, that's for people to decide. But it is a younger voice that one way or another is not as supportive of the policy status quo and is demanding much more dramatic changes. And that will clash with where most of the Democratic Party remains. It's not unlike after the 2018 midterms on other issues, a lot of the Democrats who are part of the quote unquote squad, uh, this, this young progressive cohort clashed with the majority of Democrats elected in the midterms who were much more moderate. This is Speaker Pelosi's ongoing challenge uh, that the heart of the party hasn't shifted to the left as much as you might think. And so I don't know how that's gonna play out. I, I do think the Democratic party remains pretty fractured and much more diverse certainly than Republicans have become. The party's much more united, the GOP. So, so it could be that you just have more tensions that continue to exist within the party, but they don't overwhelm the party. Uh, that you have kind of breaks that don't break Jewish support ultimately for a broader party that's more aligned uh, with, with Jewish values and Jewish history in, in the minds of those voters. And, and the Orthodox uh, Democratic connection is, is really interesting, or the Orthodox connection to established politics in New York, for a long time, Democrats benefited from that because the Democratic machine had very durable ties to these Orthodox communities in places like Brooklyn. So it remains to really be seen, can Republicans actually break that? Does that pretend any kind of national trend? But a lot of those voters are profoundly disconnected from where a lot of other American Jews are. So, so I don't know if that's going to kind of change the overall balance of American Jewish voters because of those differences on issues, again, of church and state uh, and, and uh, other kinds of questions. Great, thank you. Um, next, I'm going to take a question from the chat. Um, so this is Aviva's question. What are your thoughts about President Trump telling the Proud Boys to stand down and stand by? And maybe more generally, the Jewish reaction to white nationalist anti-Semitism in this election? Well, on, on the first part, there's, I, I'd be hard pressed uh, and, and I'd, I'd, to hear from someone who thinks that's acceptable. And it's not, and all you need to do is look up the Proud Boys and, and see what, what they're about. And I understand that the president kind of uh, wraps up comments like that in other comments that could then be used to create and, and forge ambiguity, but I think he's done this pretty consistently. And, and when I heard that, I thought it was terrible. And uh, white nationalism is a, is a real thing. White extremism is a real force in American life. It should not be discounted. The FBI itself just put out yet another study about what these groups uh, and the presence they have in this country, what they've achieved. So there should be zero signal from the president of the United States, zero ambiguity that this is not toler tolerated and, and these groups will be contained. Uh, for some of the older people in the Zoom, and, and I'm definitely one of them, 
and some of the younger people might have, maybe they took my class on this, but you know, one of the worst terrorist attacks in the United States in the last few decades was Oklahoma City, uh, where in 1995, two individuals tied with these white extremist groups uh, blew up a government building, killing over 160 people, injuring many more. And at that moment, all of a sudden, America looked at what are these white extremist organizations? Why are they growing and starting to grapple with the seriousness of this problem? And we're in a worse place right now in terms of their number, in terms of their size, and in terms of the social media platform combined with mainstream media platforms, giving them a voice. So I was disappointed to hear that kind of politics from the president. I've been disappointed before when those statements have, have been made. Uh, I don't know if it gets enough attention from the American Jewish community. I, I do believe the phenomenon of organized extremism, white extremism, which targets African Americans, Jews, Latinos, and more, is something that needs to be part of our policy discussions. The, the FBI, the Justice Department, uh, people who are civil servants in these organizations, they take it very seriously. There is no question in terms of this being a threat, but higher up, it's really uh, not, the, the, the comment is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of funded be, funds being uh, moved in the wrong direction. And this should be uh, kind of central to the next administration, whether it's Biden or whether it's a second term Trump but Trump's record is not good on this. And that comment reflected a lot more than an offhand comment. Um, and uh, I don't know what else to say, but American Jews should certainly be concerned. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I'll take another question from the chat here from um, David Holtzman. He asks, compared to other groups, how badly is American Jews voting strength diluted in presidential elections due to the electoral college. How concentrated are we in non-swing states? It's a very good question. And um, I'm just looking up, uh, you know, there was a very, uh, there's been a few good articles on which I based the comment about the turnout where it's uh, not as concentrated as it was a couple decades ago in terms of like other parts of the electorate, uh, more American Jewish voters are moving to different parts of the country. We're seeing growth in areas in the South. We're seeing growth in areas in the Midwest that has dispersed some of the Jewish vote. So in a state right now, uh, obviously certainly like Florida, but Georgia, Michigan, Ohio, a lot of these contested states, there is a big Jewish population and they could certainly play uh, a big role in the election. At the same time, one of the groups that pays some of the price of the electoral college structure remains American Jews, because it's a story of the electoral college right now of people who live in these heavily populated states, certainly on the coasts like New York or California, not having as much of a role in the election, um, because their vote is pretty much decided and the contest focuses on the swing, on the swing states. Um, but I don't think they're going to be irrelevant, David. I think uh, it, it's not unlike all the stories you read about Texas, for example, and the data that you see about how the population is changing pretty dramatically. I think that story includes American Jews. And the, the question would be, and this gets back to something Adam actually said earlier, do their voting kind of preferences change as you see those demographic moves, as, as American Jews move into communities that are more conservative, as they move into areas of the country uh, where some of the institutions that nurtured their liberalism are not as vibrant, does that change voting patterns? And I don't know the answer to that, but they are moving. And I, I think they are constrained by the electoral college, but they are still very relevant in these contested states. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll ask a question that we have here from Mark in the chat. Um, okay. He notes that you talked about anti-Semitism from the right. How about from the left with respect to Israel and otherwise? It hurt Corbyn in the UK. What impact will it have here? And maybe I'll broaden that to ask if we saw some sort of 
Corbyn-esque figure um, lead the Democratic Party, um, could you imagine um, a similar type um, voting swing that we saw in the UK with their Jewish community here in America with our Jewish community? So, so there. So the the question revolves around um, both some elected officials and some organizations uh, where anti-Semitism has already uh, flared uh, on the left, and, and that's been a, a big concern. I, I do think it's important, and I know not everyone agrees on this, but for me, it's important that. Uh, not every criticism of US Israeli policy means anti Semitism. And I think that's an important part of the conversation to have because that's often where a lot of this conversation uh, stems. That said, um, even with the voices that have trafficked in anti Semitic rhetoric, like Congresswoman uh, Omar came under fire for this early in her term, you don't really see it in the leadership of the Democratic Party right now. This gets back to that earlier question. Uh, in terms of uh, the rhetoric, in terms of a stance on American Jews, uh, and in terms even of US-Israeli policy, Speaker Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, and most of the Democratic candidates are kind of not in an area uh, being very questionable at all on American Jews. They have embraced a very pluralistic vision of this country. That's what they're fighting for. So the problem in the case of the Democrats, which could become bigger, I acknowledge that, right now it's still contained to some people and to really uh, certain pretty fringe elements in terms of the party apparatus. We could have a debate. I'm sure some would want to have a debate on Bernie Sanders as an example. But again, uh, uh, we, we can come back to that. What strikes me with the Republican Party right now is to watch President Trump embrace this kind of rhetoric. Whether you're talking about the Proud Boys or whether you're talking about your people uh, and your country, there you have the leader of the party the leader of the party, the leader of the country, embracing this kind of rhetoric. And in terms of scale and scope, you can't compare it. So I think right now, Adam, in 2020, the question is actually more pertinent for the GOP. That doesn't mean it can't change. We have seen throughout the history of the world that anti-Semitism is a powerful force. It surges, it rears its head all over the place. Corbyn is one example of, of where you're seeing it on the left. And, and if it kind of creeps up, if it reaches that level where you have that kind of rhetoric and behavior, then the Democrats would have a problem. Yes, of course they would have a problem with American Jewish voters, but they don't have that yet because that's not where the leadership of, of the party is. And I'd say one final thing uh, on this, one of the most striking parts of the rhetoric that you have seen uh, certainly from uh, the president, but also other Republicans uh, is, is this language of uh, that you talked about earlier, either of, uh, or one of the questions of talking about the American Jew is somehow focused primarily on Israel, as opposed to being American Jews who care about US Israeli policy. Those are two different things. And this refusal to take a very strong stand, not just rhetorically, but in terms of money toward white extremists. White extremists is the most virulent form of anti-Semitism that we face right now. I believe that here in the United States. It's dangerous. They are armed. And anti-Semitism and racism have gone hand in hand in this country. And uh, the party in power is not doing enough about it. So I think right now, it's more a GOP than a Democratic problem. Professor, how then would you understand some of the workings in Congress um, that have related to certain instances of, um, I guess, debatably um, uh, anti-Semitic comments? So in the Republican caucus, um, you saw the leadership expel Steve King from, I suppose, from the caucus. He lost his primary, um, whereas in the Democratic Party, um, 
when um, you know they couldn't uh, put together a resolution to singularly condemn anti-Semitism. Ilhan Omar still exists in the Democratic um, caucus and um, won her primary. So how would you understand um, you know, sort of how the Republicans in Congress dealt with that situation versus the Democrats? Well, I, I'd say, I mean, first, I think Stephen King, a self-identified white nationalist, is about as extreme as you get uh, in terms of who he is and the groups he associates with. So it would have been uh, quite something if the Republicans stood by him, which they did for a while, by the way. It wasn't automatic. Uh, the reaction against him. But let's remember, Republican support right now for President Trump is 95% within the GOP. So if the problem still exists, I don't think we can use King as evidence that the party has expunged this element. And it goes beyond those two figures. You see it with many other Republicans that, that this is a, a very big issue. So I'm not sure the King example shows that congressional Republicans really uh, have a, a strong position on this. And I think in general, they've tolerated a lot more than they've been reactive to. The Omar issue, look, I, I, there's many American Jews who are critical of the Democrats not for not censuring her uh, or for not taking a stronger stand. There were many Democrats who uh, distanced themselves from the comments. Um, and I just think, again, it's a, it's a scalar scope. I think she's a first year legislator when this came out. I do think she's incredibly sloppy in the language that she uses. I think she's used language that shouldn't be tolerated. I, I think it's not tolerable, but you're not talking about a leader of the party. You're not talking about a leader of the party. You're talking about a marginal figure right now in the party compared to the leadership of the party. So I think that's part, part of the difference. But I wouldn't agree. I'm sorry that the Republicans have really reacted to the kind of reactionary politics we've seen in the last few years. And I'll ask another question from the chat here. No. Um, we have a question from Maris. What are your thoughts about the shift in the Supreme Court to an almost permanent conservative court? And how will that affect the Jewish vote? Well, it's a huge story. Uh, I, I think I just uh, I'm writing something on this. I, I think we tend with President Trump to focus on uh, logically a lot of the vitriol and divisiveness that comes out of his Twitter feed or at his rallies. But in many ways, he's been a very transformative president. And I don't think people have reckoned with that. There's areas of policy, certainly immigration and taxation and deregulation where I think the consequences of the uh, first term, last term or first term, I don't know the answer, will be significant, but the court is a big one. Uh, the president has moved very fast with Senator McConnell to fill federal appointments. And what you're about to see with the Supreme Court is a 6-3 conservative block that will be the equivalent, if not more powerful than the Earl Warren court in the 1960s which was a force for a legal a liberal legal liberalism or liberal legalism, whatever you want to call it, on issues like voting rights and uh, privacy and civil liberties. Now, uh, the president has been able to do that to the Supreme Court, and this confirmation will go through. It's it's not really a question. Uh, Senator McConnell announced this before the president even said who the nominee was. Uh, so I think this is incredibly consequential. I do think it will have an effect on issues ranging from reproductive rights to the separation of church and state. And unless American Jewish voters start to undertake some of the shifts we've talked about, it will strengthen and solidify, I think, uh, American Jewish voters' loyalty to the Democratic Party, because this is really consequential in terms of long-term uh, policy. And, and so that's my guess. But I don't know this other kind of pocket we keep talking about. If that expands, this might be a reason more conservative Jewish voters can say, I'm with President Trump, even if I don't like the rest of it, that this is a real important change in areas that I care about. Uh, and he's created this unbeatable conservative block. Remember in the court, 5-4 is a lot smaller than 6-3 because now one justice like Justice Roberts can no longer swing his vote 
and check the conservative bloc. They have the votes they need on most issues. So it's, it's big news that just happened this week. With, of course, I'll add, you know, the passing of another great iconic American Jewish figure. Uh, and, and I hope everyone, Republican or Democrat, can agree on that. Uh, uh, with uh, RBG and, and her passing. I think that'll be something in the history books we really talk about uh, in terms of American Jewish politics through the court and figures who've just had this uh, immense impact on an area of American public life. Okay, thank you so very much. I think um, we're about to hand it over to Amihai to wrap it up. Um, but I'll just say if you have any closing thoughts, now is the time. Um, or if you don't, I'll leave you with a closing question. Um, I think tonight you talked about a lot of issues that would maybe swing the Jewish vote at the margins, but not nothing that will you know, change their minds. Do you think there is anything, um, any particular issue that would um, dramatically change the Jewish vote? I, I don't see it right now. I mean, I think the, the parties are pretty much the, aligned where the American Jewish electorate is. And I keep coming back to the story of polarization in, in our country. And it's very hard to move people away from their identity. And I keep coming back to this remarkable thing that the pandemic didn't totally realign American politics yet. Uh, you know, no incumbent would ever want to have this happen to them. And yet, uh, President Trump has a chance at re-election and his numbers within the GOP remain, you know, pretty solid. Um, so I can't think of the issue right now. I, I don't think in the end it's going to be U.S.-Israel relations. And I just don't know uh, kind of what it would be that would take uh, an electoral group that has been uh, so tied to a party. And now we're in an era where those partisan ties are stronger than ever to move them in dramatic fashion. Uh, I think all the trends are just gonna solidify what we have with segments peeling off though, dramatically and permanently, including the Orthodox, you know, parts of the Orthodox Jewish community. Oh, is that Thank you. Okay. No, that's it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna hand it over to Amihai, I guess, to. If I could just say one thing, I'm part of this vote 100 here, and, and I do want to just say as I started, I hope everyone here can uh, have, have a plan uh, to get that vote in either through mail or in person and to do everything possible to make sure your friends and, uh, and professors and everyone uh, comes out on election day. It's a, where Princeton's trying to get 100% participation. There's no, no reason that everyone who can vote shouldn't vote. So. Uh, let's, I hope we can have, have that happen. So thank you for having me here. Thank you, Professor Zelzer. Uh, and thank you all for joining us again. Uh, I also wanna uh, give a special thanks to Sila and Adam for moderating and also everyone who helped out with organizing the event, uh, the CJL staff, Marnie Blitz, Rabbi Ira Dunn, Claire Spaulding and Debbie Orell, and also Joe Shipley from Vote 100. Um, and then before we go, I just want to reiterate uh, the message that Professor Zelizer just left you all with. Um, this event is really meant to uh, be part of an effort to encourage people to vote and be engaged in the upcoming election in a number of ways. Um, it's obviously important to make your voice heard up and down the ballot, whether it be national elections or local elections. Um, so there are a couple links in the chat that I want to call your attention to. Uh, first is uh, TurboVote. Uh, which you can check out to get information about uh, things like registering to vote and requesting an absentee ballot uh, and to formulate your plans for voting. Um, also, um, you know, everyone who attended this event is probably more likely to vote than the general population. It's kind of a self-selecting thing, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other things you can do. Uh, you can encourage friends to vote. You can volunteer as a poll worker. Uh, there are just numerous ways that you can get engaged beyond just your vote. And so um, with that, the second link is a MotiVote page um, organized by Meets Vote, the Hill International Initiative. Um, there's a Princeton page and you can earn points and prizes for inviting friends uh, to the page, encouraging them to vote and also doing all sorts of voting related uh, tasks and like in volunteering and things like that. Um, so recommend you check that out as well. 
Um, thanks again to everyone for joining us and uh, to Professor Zalzer uh, and hope everyone has a good night.